Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bobby Elias and as chairman of the Associated Student Speakers Program, I'd like to welcome you to our fourth lecture of the winter quarter. Today we have with us Mr. Peter Max, who is an artist, illustrator, and designer. Mr. Max was born in Berlin, Germany in 1939 and was raised in Shanghai, where his father was a wealthy pearl merchant. His family lived in China for 12 years and then moved to Tibet, and a year later moved again, this time to Israel. At age 13, Peter enrolled in the University of Haifa to study astronomy, but also began to study art with an Austrian who lived on Mount Carmel. After brief stints in Rome and Paris, his family next moved to New York, where Peter studied at the Art Students League for five years. In 1962, Peter Max went into partnership and opened an art studio in Manhattan. And in the next three years, they worked for many important ad agencies on Madison Avenue and won 62 design awards. In 1965, Peter Max gave up the studio, shut himself up in a huge apartment for two years, and drew hundreds of designs for the future. In 1969, Life magazine presented its annual awards to leading Americans, and Peter Max was selected for art. Beginning March 30th, his latest creation, a new form called Transit Art, will be displayed on 22,000 buses across the country and will be seen by 50 million people. Mr. Max is presently in town for a month-long exhibition and sale of his works at the Upstairs Gallery in Long Beach, most of the proceeds of which are being donated to the Long Beach Children's Memorial Hospital. After Mr. Max's speech, there will be a question and answer period. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Peter Max. Thank you. Uh, as far as the buses go, that was last year. <laughs> um, just coming down before, I saw a rally uh, being put together, um, trying to work out again world situations. And um, I guess uh, we have a split house that way. Um, over the last four and a half years, I was uh, incredibly deeply involved in building something called Peter Max. And while I was doing this, I thought of nothing else except to do that. I did it with my whole body and soul, with all my energies, and I threw myself into the work so completely that I really embraced what was coming on, which was the Aquarian Age, this uh, enormous tidal wave, in a design sense. Uh, today if, uh, is a day which is about five or six months after I've taken a new turn in my whole approach to life. I've gone in, into a completely different way. I've chucked the, aside this thing called Peter Max, not so it will not continue, but it does continue because I've created it. But I've realized that it was a platform from which I can speak, um, from which I can bring about some kind of change onto this planet. And for the last five, six months, I've been realizing the strength of this platform and the amazing ability uh, I can have by talking to a national audience from a place like that. Uh, some of you might know that about four and a half years ago, I got very deeply involved in yoga and brought a great sage to the United States uh, by the name of Swami Sachidananda. And um, sort of half naive and half in faith, I went about with full energy and opened up a whole series of yoga centers with him. We have now 14 yoga centers around the United States servicing close to a half a million kids uh, on a non-permanent level. We probably have close to 200,000 kids that come to the yoga centers uh, pretty often. Um, since um, Swami Sachinanda has come here, quite a few other great sages have come here. Uh, you see some of the people sitting around today in turbans, they're from the Yogi Bhajan group, another great yogi who happens to be in the United States now, doing the same kind of effective work. There's a 
fantastic reason why all this is happening. This thing that started in 1965, when um, we first started feeling the tidal wave of the Aquarian Age, when it first started in the drug area, acid, and um, we got through the flower power and beans and all these phenomena that were carrying, carrying on, that were pretty much shaking up the country, especially the establishment. Um, nobody realized what it was. Many of the people involved had a feeling of what it was, but nobody really knew. And uh, then it was established as a uh, joint consciousness that this was the Aquarian Age. It is a new age. It is a period that a new change will come about. It's a threshold of the Golden Age. What's taking place uh, during a period like this is a physiological change. Um, in yoga, uh, they might call it, it, it's raising the chakra level, where the consciousness dwells in a higher place than it has dwelled before. And in order to be able to get to a place like this, one has to incorporate into one's life uh, new things. Yoga is one of the systems. Yoga has many facets to it and has many systems. Uh, what yoga does is bring about a certain peace of mind into the body and gives about a tremendous amount of concentration and willpower. A great yogi is a man who has, or a woman, who has a tremendous amount of will they call it a will of steel and has a vision that's crystal clear and has abilities that are the highest that they've ever had before. Every individual comes into, into life the way we all have, comes into life with a series of potentials. We have uh, what they call in yoga karma potentials, which are potentials of the work that we do. We have psychic potentials, which are sort of mystical abilities that we have in relating to people on another plane. And as one gets involved in the practice of yoga, these things start unfolding. Our, our life start taking on a completely new shape. In other words, the things that we thought we could have been, we suddenly become. The things that we, we thought we like to do in a mental way, we suddenly have the ability of doing. And suddenly our role in life becomes one completely different than it ever has been before. That new role in life is something very important. It's bringing about a new age. We become more conscious about how we relate to others and what we try to bring about in others. Uh, each one of us is a unique individual and a god. A God-realized person, except there are veils that we've created between experiencing this realization and not experiencing the realization. Yoga takes these veils away. Now how does yoga work? Yoga has disciplines, which are some of them are called Hatha Yoga, and the Hatha Yoga discipline is one that works with the body. It stimulates the spine, and it brings about good health into the body. There's meditation, which helps concentration. The only way that we'll be able to bring about a very healthy planet in our own lifetime is by propagating something like that. There are today probably millions and millions of young kids around the country that are very deeply involved in a spiritual activity like this. There's another thing that's happening, especially here in LA, it's called the Institute of Ability, which is uh, founded by Charles Brenner. What they do over there is relating exercises. You learn how to teach, uh, how to become each other's gurus, each other's teachers. You learn how to listen to one another, and you learn how to speak to another. The idea of being able to relate to another properly is very significant because if one is able to relate to another in a very strong way, express oneself, and is heard, 
then there are no accumulation of bad energies. But if we have a tremendous will to express ourselves and someone is not willing to hear this, uh, even though they might be sitting there making believe they're hearing, but are not willing to listen, they are not giving the individual that wants to express himself the receivership. Therefore, the one that's expressing himself starts accumulating bad energies. And eventually, these things come out in for form of frustrations. And after frustrations, they become outbursts of anger, outbursts of anxiety. Now, I was speaking to a group right over here about four days ago, which uh, were a mixed faculty group and especially art students, people who are very interested in uh, getting involved in the creative fields. Now, basically, whatever you're involved in has to do with the creative field. And what one has to do is find out how do you tap this creative field? Where is this creative field to be tapped from? Where does one come up with original ideas? The thing is that within all of us, we've got an ocean that's filled with these ideas. An ocean that's completely unique to ourselves. Our own ocean, which is sort of connected to a master ocean. But our own ocean, where our own ideas are present. And the only way that we can ever really become original thinkers and become these great people, great men and great women, in our own lifetime to experience this is to find a method of tapping this creative reservoir. Um, I've struggled for many years um, trying to find out where this reservoir was and I've looked many areas. Some were very naive, some were done in very brute acts, some were done in intelligent acts, some were done in mistakes. And finally when I met a great master from the East a real sage who turned me on in one split second. I walked up to him and he walked up to me. He looked me in the eyes and I completely had known that what is within this man is what my search has been all about. So I completely followed him. I became a follower. I had never been a follower before in my whole life. Now, the reason I'm talking about this, and I'm not really rapping too much about, you know, Peter Max and my art and so forth, because that's been done. This is something that I went through in another phase of my life. And it's a phase that is still important, because what it has given me now is a platform. While I was struggling to create this thing, I sincerely thought this is, was all I was creating. I had no idea that I was creating something else that will be used as a platform for me to do something else again because my involvement in what I was doing was so immense, my concentration was so focused onto creating this thing that I was blinded by the effort itself, not realizing how to step out and see what I was doing. But as my involvement in yoga became greater, I started seeing what that was. And there, a separation started occurring between me, a human being, and this thing over here that I created called Peter Max, all these designs and so forth. And they started going in two separate ways. I'm still the caretaker of that phenomenon that was created, and I'm still trying to mold it so it can go into a purer and purer direction and reach people in a greater kind of a mass. But the thing that I've discovered and have completely have realization of, that I am not that, that this is just a creation of mine. So, it's very important for individuals to realize that what they're creating is a creation and they themselves are not that creation. They are the total sum of all the creations. They are the total sum of their body, their mind, and probably all the past lifetimes that we must have been through uh, in this universe. Today, at the Integral Yoga Institute and 3HO, which these gentlemen represent, and the Yo Institute of Ability, there are a lot of individuals right here in the city, many of them belonging to this school, that are on the path of enlightenment. And um, I really would like to invite anybody that wants to come down 
to check for yourself the kind of vibes you get in a place like this and to see how true that particular vibration is to what you think the Aquarian Age is all about. And if it fits, then you possibly might want to be part of that. Um, this is so important uh, a step to take, to take out an afternoon and, and, and check these things out and see what kind of work individuals are, are putting in now. While life is going on and while we have wars and lots of misunderstanding on this planet, there are many individuals that have come out of very regular families in regular suburbia or city life that have taken this path right now. This does not mean that you've got to give up what you're doing, except what it means is you do what you're doing a hundredfold better. And to do something a hundredfold better, what, re what it really means that it is in a perfect direction. It is flowing with the flow of nature. And when you flow with the flow of nature, then everything you do has a receivership because you're doing it with a very pure purpose. And the things that allow something not to have a pure purpose is a misunderstanding of what life is all about. I would like to uh, welcome right now any questions that you have so I can get into other categories of discussion because the time that we have is really short and um, I'm going back to New York tonight and I've done as much legwork as I can in the LA area right now uh, to bring about some of these uh, understandings that I'm trying to achieve. So if anybody has any questions, uh, I would be glad to answer it. I have a question. What? There are mics on either side. Where are the mics? Right over there. But possibly if somebody can direct the question at me, I could repeat it. Um, a couple of times during your talk, I had the feeling as almost as if part of your attitude is almost as if you wanted to like tear down the poster that's in front of the podium. And a second point is have you ever considered the uh, possibility where <laughs> perhaps you state this platform that you wish you think you've established and can start speaking out, perhaps using the Peter Max image you've created in some sort of like cartoon strip where you can express things that you wish to? Yes, uh, there is a, uh, a strip going into the papers, which is going to be called Meditations, where um, spiritual ideas are being expressed. That's one thing. Um, you have to understand that this Peter Max platform, as far as, in other words, it might not be a very powerful or important platform for an audience like this, it happens to be, a, 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 on the other hand, a very important audience, uh, a platform for people who react to it in a certain way. It's, um, you could take, for instance, a, um, a situation where I, like what happened to me two days ago, there was a very great exhibit in Long Beach, a gallery where there were these uh, suburban families, you know, heavy drinking scene and everybody came upstairs and, and um, you know, congratulated uh, me for bringing my exhibit to Long Beach and so forth. Of course, my main purpose was really to relate to them on, on, on yoga and get some of these ideas across. They were so ex extremely interested that they're now uh, putting together a yoga center in Long Beach. So it reaches certain people in some way and it reaches certain people in another way. The main thing is that I want to do this very much and I'm just really standing here uh, offering and willing to help anybody involved in getting involved in, in yoga because it is such an enormous, unbelievable power that can only be experienced, even words cannot really express it. Yeah, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Speaking as Peter Max the artist, uh, how do you feel when your art is suddenly on people's bed sheets and book covers and uh, on posters everywhere and on buses and everything. Does that in any, I mean not now, now that you're into yoga, but did that at all dilute the idea you had behind it? 
Not really, because even the thing that I was expressing at the time was, you know, to bring about Aquarian imagery into, into the masses. And see, this whole thing came about when I didn't really feel like going into galleries and sort of carrying a painting under my arm and, and begging to be in the group show. I saw a, a medium, just like TV is a medium, magazines and radio are a medium, that the buses and merchandise is also a medium because every, you know, three times a year or four times a year, thousands of trucks leave a factory and spread it around the United States, around the world. And, you know, I was really turned on by the idea that I had the ability to possibly put my imagery onto this and turn people on. Of course, to turn them on with a, with a bed sheet of stars is not as powerful as being able to have a uh, articulating relationship with somebody, but at least it turned their head a half of one degree someplace else. They, they, in other words, they suddenly became in tune with a new thing. That thing was part of the Aquarian age. People don't even know how to articulate it yet. What is that thing you're doing and is that, that new stuff that's psychedelic or so forth? They really don't know what it is. I know what it is, but by putting it on so many things and letting people bring that into their life instead of bringing things that really don't have that kind of expression to their life is also an important step. At the time it was my most important step. Of course now it is as important as everything else I'm doing. It's part of everything. Yeah. Well I saw you in San Francisco they had a show of your paintings. Now what did it take for you to get out of the scene of going to a gallery and showing your paintings? Actually what happened is while I was going the commercial route and putting my work on, on that commercial canvas, so to speak, um, I was, you know, in my heart, I really sort of felt I really wanted to be in museums and galleries because the art that I'm doing is not a cop-out art. It's, you know, it's when I do a sheet, I don't sit there and design a sheet. That sheet is taken from an original drawing that I did three months before when I had the inspiration in here and I drew something. So later on, it seems to have the right kind of size, and I, I put it on, and people put it into production. So the art is pure, and I always knew my art level. But what happened is that um, the museum, uh, um, the De Young Museum came and said, we'd like to give you a one-man show. And they gave me the whole right wing of the museum, which is about two rooms this size, stuffed with work, five years of retrospective work, that was hung on the ceilings and floors and everything. And it did have such a great reaction on the museum level for museum people, uh, where there were more people coming to that show than the, any other show they had since the opening of the show some 80 years ago, about three times an audience that the Van Gogh show had in 65, that 14 other museums now across the country are running the show. It travels about every two months. That's a good thing, you see, because there should be other things, just like there are Beatle records and there are great philosophies that are being spread. It should happen in the art. There should be more artists doing it, and more artists, artists taking a cosmic canvas, in other words, a canvas that's a year 2000 canvas, rather than a canvas of the turn of the century, which is, you know, hand-ground paints and hand-knitted uh, canvas. But as I understand it, you're not doing that anymore. You're not I'm still deal. doing it. Or you still are. I'm going to be continuing it, but the thing is, I'm not active anymore. The thing that I have launched now is moving on its own. You see, now I'm just putting purity, more and more purity into it. Uh, we have a very large studio in New York and over 50% of the activity over there is for the causes of, of helping the planet. I'm using art staff, you know, that are making money off of those projects to do that work. So it's very important to keep the studio going and to have, you know, we're putting out magazines and we're putting out, God knows, so many fantastic things right now. And, uh, there, there's a lot of help needed because even at the yoga centers that we have over here, uh, the yoga center uh, the, at the Integral Yoga Institute and Yogi Bhajans, there are quite a few people, but if more people knew about it, there'd be other great people. I'm sure in this audience here there might be like a few dozen incredible people that once they got involved in yoga have, an, have the opportunity and will develop abilities very fast to really participate in, in bringing about this uh, planet, which is our planet. Yes? Peter, I understand that you have been to an enlightenment intensive to blow your hang-ups and improve your relationships with people. Can you tell me about that, please? Yes. Um, this is a, a very unique thing. Um, 
It's called abilitism. Abilitism is something that was devised by Charles and Eva Brenner. And uh, it's a, relax, a, a, a re relating uh, type exercise where two people sit opposite each other and what they do is they have five minute intervals where each person speaks for five minutes and the other person listens for five minutes. But what they're talking about are specific questions that were given to them. For instance, the first question might be, who are you? In other words, tell me who you are. And then you have to, in your own mind, think, think, who am I? And as the idea comes to your mind of who you are, you articulate it. So in the first time you might say, you know, I'm, I'm George or I'm Harry and I'm a boy or I'm a girl, or I'm an artist or I'm a salesman or I'm a student. And, you know, after about five or ten minutes of articulating all that, you've just about said everything that you thought you were. Now, these exercises last 18 hours a day and they last for five days. What are you going to do for the other <laughs> 17 and a half hours and times five days? So it starts getting very serious. In other words, you suddenly feel maybe that you're lost. Where are you? Who am I? Because all these things, in other words, the name, the fame, the clothing we wear is not who we are. The thing that we think we are is not who we are. If we're sad, that's not who we are. So, in this kind of relating exercises, one has an opportunity to express to the other for five minutes who they are. Then the same person that was just expressing it has an opportunity to listen to the other person for five minutes and see what the other person thinks he is. And this thing keeps on going and starts building. And suddenly after a few hours, sometimes a few days, and sometimes not at all, and you've got to come back for another intensive. But most of the time, within the intensive of five days, one finds out who they are. Once they found out who they are, they raise up their hand, a monitor comes over and he says, I know who I am. <laughs> and uh, he says, okay, uh, I'll put you down for an interview. You go downstairs and there are these people and they say, okay, tell me who you are. Now, if you really know who you are and you're speaking from that level, you know, it's received. If you don't know who we are, he'll say to you, like he said to me the first time, you're this far away. Now, I was really, it blew my mind to be this far away of who I am. Who was I? <laughs> so I went back upstairs, another three hours, four hours, nighttime came, went to sleep next morning, worked hard again, and suddenly I really knew who I was. You know, some things happened, and it came. And as soon as I knew who I was, I ran down there, got my interview, he says, congratulations. Now go upstairs and tell me what you are. So you go on for another 18 hours, maybe 24 hours, and you really work very hard, and you go through some crises because you think you're a really bad, mean person, and you don't want to be that, and you think you're this, or you think you're that, or think that you're a brute and you have no abilities. You think all these various things, and suddenly you come close to finding out what you are. This one, who you are, and what it is that that thing is. There's another deeper question. It's sort of like going... It's taking that final point that you've reached and opening it up and going into that. That is quite unbelievable to experience that. And finally when you get that and he doesn't tell you that you're two inches away and he says you've got it, he says now go upstairs and your new question is tell me what life is. So now it's not anymore you, what is life? What is all this that is happening simultaneously in this room right now? The plants, the people, what's happening outside, the activity that's happening on all the rooms, staircases and elevators moving, trees, you know, this planet revolving like this, the solar system moving around, galaxies, all of life. What is that? That's an important one. <laughs> so it's so important, you know, that you figure out, well, how could I know what all this is? But you go at it. And again, just the way you said, I'm Jimmy, and I'm Harry, and I'm Joe, you start saying those things about that, maybe a little bit better because you've already had some experience, and you start getting into that driver's seat, and you start working. And then you find out what life is. Well, by the time you find out what life is, you're already into a Buddha realization. You're into, into that thing they call samadhi. You're sitting there, and, 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 and life is total. You completely experience it. 
it's almost like you've got billions of arteries leaving every pore of your body embracing all of life and every aspect of something else tells you what it is and you feel so complete and so related to it and then you go downstairs and you tell him what life is and then he might ask you tell me what the purpose of life is why is it what's the purpose that life is to begin with so you go through that one and there's another one which is a pretty heavy one it's called tell me what another is what is another what is another and you try to experience another now we might say well another is a guy sitting in a tan shirt and blue jeans that's the same thing as saying it's a Harry or Joe but to really experience what another is is to totally experience to experience his breath to experience his mind his calm to experience his potentials that might not even be realized by himself and beyond that and more and much more that's what the experiences for, uh, tell me what another is some people have achieved all these levels of enlightenment in the five days th that were there this is only possible today because it's the Aquarian age because Buddha had to sit under a tree for 30 years to get that these things are available today of course Buddha got other things too that we might not know about or went beyond that Abilitism is something that's available, especially right here in this town. It started over here. It started actually in a pla place called Lucerne Valley, which is outside, two hours outside LA, in the desert, a beautiful place. It looks like a Tibetan lamasery. And there are these people walking around that are really extremely high. And all you have to do is just walk by them and you see how high they are. And, uh, you know, you suddenly realize there's nothing else in life you would like more than being that high. Because, you know, in this, in this age that we live in, we all grew up over here and it's a world of technology and we have tasted every conceivable texture, we have bitten into every texture, we have touched it, embraced it, washed ourselves and then worn every conceivable structure, texture that technology can bring about. But the one thing that we haven't really experienced is that inner peace. The thing is called God. The thing that's behind all of this. We all know it's something and all we, well, we always say, well, let somebody else find out. But you know, everybody else can find out. That means you'll never find out. It's something that you've got to go through and personally dedicate a certain amount of energy of your life to do it. It's like, uh, you know, you go into a, a, a store and you buy yourself a Sony tape recorder and with this little tape recorder comes a little pamphlet that tells you when to change the batteries, when to take it back for inspections. And uh, the same, you get these things in the, in the glove compartment of your car, you get it with your refrigerator. But what do you have for yourself? Do you have a little book to see, like, what to do? No, we get, get up in the morning, and uh, probably we're, to begin with, not very happy. Then we eat, and we do something else that we've been doing for years already, and we ricochet in these same kind of thoughts and activities that we do year after year after year. And we never even like step away for a few seconds and say, hey, what have I been doing the last hundred days? Have I like tried to find out what is the purpose of me doing it? But you just keep on doing it. Why? Why do you keep on doing it? Because you've never actually questioned yourself why to do it. So when one gets involved in, 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 in a thing like yoga or something and meditates for a few minutes, suddenly the next day when you wake up and you grab something to stuff into the mouth when you may be on a diet or know it's no good for you you suddenly have this discipline and you walk away from it and suddenly like something happens when you do that you feel like a tingle, a freedom you've done something you've maybe subconsciously always wanted to do but never did and then the next act happens you maybe open the door for someone or you have uh, you peel an orange and you keep the peels in your pocket or in your hand until you find a garbage can and you throw it in and you feel good about it that's the different thing you feel good about it and all these good feelings start elevating you and bring you closer to what is called enlightenment if the whole life and every activity of life is done with this kind of consciousness you become pure bliss the only thing is we do all the things the opposite way we overeat, so we feel a little bit guilty. But we already are so used to feeling guilty that that gets shoved into the inside within one-tenth of a second. 
and it's there, just like working on the stomach, then we pick up a cigarette and we smoke. Certainly, I know everybody who smokes has guilt for one instant of a second, and that guilt seems to disappear with the first puff, but it's in there. So all these things start accumulating, and then we don't know, like, what is it all about? It's terrible. We feel bad. Life's going bad. We're growing old fast. We're getting fat. We can't relate to people. We don't have lovers. We don't have people listening to us because we are projecting a result of all negative activities. Negative activities. So what we have to do is realize what to do every minute. How to relate to somebody. When somebody comes up to you and he's got a bad, mean look, you just look at him and then he doesn't know why he's got a bad, mean look. But sometimes we might say and turn and walk away and he hasn't had a chance to express himself. Even a person who's got a bad, mean look has tried so hard to express himself and has been rejected for so long that it's become a worse look. So now he's going around trying to say something that might have been something really sweet once, but nobody listened to him, that it seems that it, as if it's really something really mean and something bad. So now especially we don't want to hear him. But imagine taking a person like this and embracing him and patting him the way you pat a little baby when it's trying to burp, you know, and really giving of yourself to his expression, feeling everything that he's trying to say, not just the look on his face and the lines of his face, but listening to everything he's trying to say, and even reading behind the words, because he might say this but mean that, being able to, open to understand it. I'll give you another example. Can you imagine what would happen if all of us, I don't mean just all of us here, but all of us, who've been putting on such negativity, such negative exhibition towards a president of the United States, such hate, such resentment, such reactions to a person who's probably not even responsible for one millionth of what he was hated for. Imagine if everybody opened up their hearts and just loved up that guy. Can you imagine what his actions in life would be? He'd have to play ping pong with you. He'd have to do that in return. But right now he's reacting onto that. He thinks that all the youth of America hate him. He's trying to like stop everyone from hating him. That's all. Now he's an intelligent person. I'm sure he's doing things with unbelievable reasons and so forth. He's confined. He's probably in some straitjacket. He can't really move uh, in a cabinet like this. But imagine if for one month all these people who have created head new, uh, news lines and broken windows and done all these things towards a man that is trying to help us if we just loved him up the way you love a little baby. Can you imagine what would happen to this country? Can you imagine how he would speak up on behalf of situations that we're trying to get going? That's the whole cause. This is the misunderstanding. See, we think because there's a Vietnam and God, everybody doesn't want to have a Vietnam. Everybody cries in their hearts because there's young people our age dying in Vietnam. But we think because there's a Vietnam that he singularly is responsible for happening. There is a network of things that make this happen that he himself is almost in confusion of. But now, you know, in order to at least give him the ability to break through, just like we break through with those questions of who am I, let him break through and solve that particular problem, is to love him up. That should be a slogan. Everybody who goes in there should be loved up and everybody below him. Because if they get filled up with that love and they are swimming in so much love, you know it's going to happen. Right? It's going to happen. It has to happen. This is, what has to, what, this is what the Aquarian Age is about. The fact that a man has finally reached through in this lifetime on such an enormous planet, and we're so small compared to this enormous planet, and he has reached to the top of all those activities, with the billions and billions and billions of things that are happening on this, on this planet that this country is responsible for, for this man to f finally be there on top to dictate or help promote ideas and concepts and analyze and be a man of decision. Whether we like the way he looks or not, whether we like what's happening in the country, what's most important is love him up. Time for one more short question. Okay, I have time for one more short question. Yes. I'll tell you what, um, anybody wants to know anything about the Institute of Ability or Yogi Bhajan's group or the IYI, I've brought with me 
all my beautiful, lovable yogi friends who are really young sages, believe it or not, you'll see these people in the next few years turning on the world. And if you go there and you see the activity, you'll realize that. They're right here and they will give you on paper where to come down. And just go down there once and check out the scene. See what happens. Um, so this is my last question, I guess. Anybody's interest, just come forward and my friends will come up here and we'll, they're various groups. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much.